Awesome. I was afraid everyone hit the parties and would be a little bit quieter this morning. Well, I'm Megan. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Drupal Association. I'm really excited to be up here today. And I just wanted to talk briefly about some of the great things that are happening in open source and how that's translating into Drupal. And then I'd like to do my favorite part of my program, which is highlighting some community members we've worked with who have done some amazing things to help uh, Drupal thrive this year. So the Drupal Association's just been studying what's happening in open source so we can see how Drupal is tracking with that. And I could spend a whole hour talking about some amazing uh, data points that we've been finding. Uh, but I'm not going to do that because I have 15 minutes, so I'll give you the TLDR. And in short, open source is winning. And there, yeah, that's right. <laughs> So there's a report that comes out every year called The Future of Open Source, and it's put out by Black Duck and Northbridge. It has tons of really great data points, and there's two I wanted to call out today. Uh, they interviewed 1,500 people, and they found that 78% of the companies are using open source. And that adoption has doubled since 2010. So that is a huge sign for open source, that we're really thriving. And even more importantly, contribution has been going up too. And so these people that are adopting open source in their companies are really committed to contributing back to the projects. 66% said they're contributing back, and that's a 50% increase just from last year alone. And that is the holy grail, right? This is how open source keeps growing and growing and becoming so innovative. And so as we look around, we also see that open source is using mature traditional growth strategies. And there's all kinds of things that happened this year in the open source market from VC funding to organizations like Docker. Hortonworks just went public. And there's several mergers and acquisitions, Pentaho just being one of, one of many. And then of course, wow. Did not expect to see Microsoft open source.net. I know I was blown away. And I think it's just a huge sign of what's happening, you know, the power of open source and how people are really embracing it. And so we looked at all these great things that are happening in open source, and we started looking at Drupal, and we're seeing that there are some really uh, similar trends in sh showing the health of Drupal. And that's also really exciting. I'll show you just a few things that we are uh, seeing. So we know that we're powering 12% of the top 100,000 sites, and that number is going to keep going up, especially as we have organizations like weather.com weather adopting Drupal. And just recently, phase two announced that uh, Sloan Kettering, a leading hospital, has adopted Drupal. And actually, it was an enterprise Drupal 8 beta installation. Uh, so clearly, people are chomping at the bit for the software you're building. And so that's not going to work. There we go. Uh, some other data points. We put out a survey this past year. Uh, to understand what's happening in the Drupal talent marketplace. And we interviewed hundreds of companies. We're finding that 82% are looking to hire Drupal talent in the next six months. 40% are in constant hiring mode. And when we asked, what's driving all this talent acquisition? And 75% said, it is all based on market demand. We just need to keep hiring so we can meet all the customer need. So those are some really great facts that market adoption is growing for Drupal. And again, going back to the contribution, we are also seeing a major uptick in the number of people who are contributing to our project. Uh, Dries even mentioned this in his keynote yesterday, that for G7, there were um, 950 people about that were contributing to the project, and now we have over 2,800 contributors. And that just blows me away. And we're so thankful for all these people, and we really need everyone jumping in right now so we can get this project across the, the finish line. And then, of course, we're seeing the same kind of growth strategies in our own Drupal marketplace. So products built on Drupal are getting VC funding. And, of course, we've seen quite a few mergers and acquisitions this year. Even just this week, Pantheon announced that they acquired Node Squirrel. So that's a pretty exciting uh, news item that came out this week. So clearly, there is an upswell of Drupal opportunities. And as they say, high tides raise all boats. And if you haven't already, you're going to start feeling these opportunities and seeing them in your own life. But the Drupal Association does not want you just bobbing in a sea of opportunities. 
We want to give you the programs and the tools so that you can ride the wave and really control your destiny. And yesterday, Holly spoke a little bit about our programs that we have to help you uh, help sustain the community so you can build and promote the software. And now I get to kind of shift to my favorite part, which is I would like to highlight some people that we've had the honor of working with. They've used our programs, and we've been able to take off some of the burden so they could do great things for the project. So I would really like to point out some great things we're doing with Drew Gorton. So he has been running the Twin Cities Camp in Minnesota for the last couple years. And if you're a camp organizer, you know it's really hard to put together an event and grow it and make it professional and have to deal with all those logistics. And you certainly don't want to have to have funds coming in and out of your own personal checking account. It's really hard. And we need these camps. They are the marketing engines that are all over the world, bringing people into our community and leveling up skills. So we created the fiscal sponsorship program where we provide all the accounting resources for our camp leaders. And we've been working with Drew for the last couple years so that we can handle the, that kind of work and then he can shift his energies to growing his camp and professionalizing it. And um, he's also even worked with his community to help raise over $500 for the Drupal 8 Accelerate uh, fundraiser. So Drew, if you could stand up, I'd like to recognize you. Thank you. And so uh, we also provide scholarships to help people come to DrupalCon. We're very strategic with um, who we bring in because we bring people to DrupalCon, they go back to their, uh, their towns, their cities, their countries, then they can help spread more information about Drupal. And so uh, we did give a couple scholarships out this, for this event, but there's two people in particular I'd like to call out, with, which is Rachid Gupta and Chakrapani Redavari. And they flew here all the way from India. And uh, there's a few reasons why we wanted them here. One, they are both organizing camps and growing camps, uh, one in Bangalore, one in Mumbai. Uh, we want to help them see how we do it here. Maybe they'll have some ideas of how they can grow and strengthen the community in India uh, and start um, really building on the contribution culture that they have already facilitated there. Uh, they are also doing some really great programs in India. We want them to come here and show us what they're doing and have a real good knowledge share. Uh, but the other thing I'm really excited about is they are here to see what makes DrupalCon so magical so that when we go to India next year, they can help us produce a really fantastic DrupalCon. And we're going to talk more about that at the board retreat, or I'm sorry, the board meeting today at noon. And we're also going to reveal the location at the closing session on Thursday. So if Rachid and Chakrapani can stand up, thank you for coming all the way here. Thank you very much. Okay. And so we also do programs to help increase Drupal adoption. There's something we did special uh, here at this DrupalCon. Uh, we partner with Sean Diarmond, hopefully I said that right, Diarmond, and Christina DeLude. Uh, they have been volunteering their time uh, to create the Higher Ed Summit. And it was a fantastic event. It sold out not just once, it sold out twice. There was so much demand for the program that they put together. They've been volunteering their time to come up with the curriculum, and we wanted them to really focus on a really strong program and not have to worry about figuring out the venue and the catering and the ticket sales. So we took care of that part. They took care of creating a really excellent experience. And their whole mission was to get people to um, understand how to deepen Drupal's footprint in their higher ed organization and to um, make sure that Drupal's uh, providing the best ac academic experience possible. So Sean and Christina, if you could stand up. Thank you for all your hard work. Okay. And so we also have programs to help you all build the software. And you've heard from many of us so far this week about the Drupal 8 Accelerate program. This is where we have been crowdfunding uh, money from the community and from our anchor partners. And then we give it to uh, certain people that we need in a room to sprint and help reduce the criticals. 
And we've been doing several sprints over the last couple months, but there was one that really popped for me, which is in Princeton, New Jersey, which is my hometown. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it, but I thought I'd just choose that one. And so Alex and Kathy, Daniel, Jess, Kalpana, Matthew, Wim, Tim, and Peter Willannon all came together, gave up their time to sprint at the New Jersey camp. And during that weekend, they were able to knock out and fix 14 criticals. Yeah. This program's working. And I'm really excited about that. So I also want to thank the New Jersey camp organizers because they created the framework for the sprint to be able to happen. So they piggybacked off of that camp and it was really easy for them to all come together. So if you participated in that sprint or in any Drupal 8 Accelerate sprint, please stand up. We'd love to acknowledge that you're giving up your time and letting us fly you in and, and make this happen. That's awesome. Okay, and now I'd like to thank a special group, which would be the DrupalCon team, who are entering stage left for me. So, so we have Rachel and Amanda, Tina and Tim, and the reason I wanted to bring them up on stage is that the Drupal Association- Hey, Megan, yeah. uh, I wanna cut you off. What? We're, we're not really here to celebrate the events team, we're here to celebrate your birthday. What? Shut up! That's not all, that's not all. It's also Tina Krause's birthday. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, this is me! You guys are too much! Somehow we have half of our DrupalCon being born on this day, so we had to celebrate. Surprise. <laughs> So there will be birthday cake at the DA booth. If you want to come after the plenary, we will also be announcing the winner of the Sphere.io uh, developer contest. You can come and get some cake, find out who won the contest, and celebrate Tina and Megan. So happy birthday. Oh, I love Drupal. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyhow, a big hand of applause for the team that put on this amazing event. <laughs> Okay, well apparently I was all flustered and I just started going through all the slides. So let me just back up. <laughs> Hello, yay, DrupalCon team. Okay. Thank you guys, that was amazing. Okay, so if you like these stories or you like birthday cake, we need money. No, just kidding. But <laughs> so anyhow, I'd love to make more stories with you. And if you would like to donate to these kinds of programs, please consider being an individual member of the Drupal Association. If you're a Drupal business, you can become a supporting partner and help fund Drupal.org improvements. Or you can uh, contribute to the Drupal 8 Accelerate program. And so I just also want to thank all of our supporting partners who have been funding Drupal.org improvements. It's our community home and it's been so important that we've been able to improve the performance and the user experience and we're so excited about all the things on our roadmap. And then, of course, we could not put on this event without our sponsors. And so please, go hug a sponsor and go check them out, the, check out their booths. They have really great information and they help make this happen. And so uh, I do have a few announcements. We have a schedule change. So here are two, creating a culture of performance has moved and creating a culture of empowerment. But also at 10, from 1045 to 1145, in room 501 is a new session, front end open forum. So check that one out. And then also uh, we have a coffee break. I understand yesterday that the coffee was removed before it was fully emptied. We fixed that and so there is um, paid coffee all day and the free coffee is right after, uh, right after this from 1015 to 1045. And it will not move until all of you drank all of it. <laughs> I know, that's what you clap about. That's what we need right now. Uh, also, uh, if, in case you're, you're just arriving, this is the Wi-Fi uh, password, Drupal 8 Accelerate. And if you have MiFi going, please turn that off. It's uh, taken away from our bandwidth. Uh, also, lunch options. Um, 
you're a vegetarian, we have an option for you in the main buffet line. If you're vegan, you have your own buffet, so please be mindful and not eat the vegan's food if you're not vegan. And of course, keep being kind to each other. We have a lovely community, clearly, and uh, so just be mindful of the code of conduct. And get ready for Trivia Night, sponsored by Palantir. Always a great time. Let's go back. And um, we've been having a developer contest sponsored by Sphere IO. And they're going to be announcing the winner of the Drupal Association booth right after this keynote. So go check that out. And then while you're at the booth, you can go and check out the Drupal store. We have lots of really great swag, the kind of swag you want to bring home to your family and friends. So go check that out. Not sure. Well, I'm sure there's other important things I'm supposed to tell you, but the one thing I can remember is that there is a company by the name of Rockin. I call them Awesome Rockin because they just donated $5,000 to the Drupal 8 Accelerate program. Yeah. And so they have asked for you to find them on their Crowdwise fundraising page, and they're going to match any of your contributions. So thank you so much, Awesome Rockin. Rockin Awesome. <laughs> All right, and now I'm just going to hand this over to um, Tom Wentworth, Chief Marketing Officer of Acquia, who is um, our sponsor who's coming up today. And thank you again for my birthday surprise. Where do you think you're going? I'm done. Uh, no, you're not. I remember last year at uh, Austin, the dance that Megan did. What? Remember that? <laughs> um, that was crazy. It's my favorite part of the whole event, I think. Uh, so let's just come back over here for a sec, if you don't mind. Oh, no, please I'd don't like to me. introduce uh, the uh, inaugural DrupalCon Sponsor Love Dance. And I'd like you to uh, show us how to do it. Okay, wow. So that is now the official DrupalCon sponsor love dance that we will see every year. What do you guys think? Okay, that was funnier than we planned it to be yesterday, so that actually worked out uh, good, I think. All right, hold on one second. All right, well, again, thank you. My name is Tom Wentworth. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Acquia. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to stop by our booth and uh, check out our technical sessions. We have our tech team. Uh, presenting on some pretty interesting topics, so definitely uh, stop by and take a look. I'm here this morning to introduce Whitney Hess. So Whitney is a coach, writer, and speaker, helping people bring their whole selves to their work. For the last decade, she has coached hundreds of companies on how to make their products easier and more pleasurable to use, which is great. Boost their bottom line and do work they love. She's the co-host of the podcast Designing Yourself, writes on her blog, pleasure and pain, and speaks at conferences like this worldwide. So with that, I'd love to bring up our keynote speaker, Whitney. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, DrupalCon. It is so wonderful to be here with you today. We have been learning so much about what it means to develop Drupal, to develop with Drupal, and today I want to talk about another really important piece to being a member of this very special community, which is developing ourselves. I want to start with a story of how I went from a superhero to a zero in what felt like no time flat. It was in 2008, and I was working for a, soft, a financial software company, and I had 
been a member of a user experience team. There were six of us, and we had a manager, and this was a really wonderful opportunity for me. We got to do work the right way, we got to work on a great product, and whenever I met with my manager, he would often tell me what a great job I was doing. He said, you have this superpower and that superpower, and it was really boosting my ego. So about a year in, I had my first performance review, and I got a whopping five out of five stars, which meant that I was entitled to the biggest bonus possible. About a month later, there was a project that two designers on my team had been diligently working on for a couple years. It was a full redesign of our core product. And our manager needed them to move on to a different project. And so he came to me and he told me that he was going to put me on their project. And he was going to need me to ramp up with them and I was going to now usher their work through all um, the remaining phases of implementation. And he had been telling me how great I was, so I was feeling like this was an amazing opportunity to really put my stamp on what was going to be a critical product for the company. Well, in um, one of the first meetings where my fellow designers were walking me through their work, I was seeing a lot of things that I thought could have been done better, could have been improved upon. And because I had this idea that I was such a valuable member of the team, I didn't hesitate to tell them so. So we had a few meetings where they were trying to ramp me up and I was saying things like, hmm, well why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? And it turns out I was rubbing people the wrong way. I found out from my manager shortly thereafter that I was really not there to give my opinion. I was there to bring their work forward. And the way that I had been presenting myself, the way I'd been talking about how they could have been doing things better was really inappropriate. And this shocked me because there I was thinking I was so valuable and that my contributions would be valued, and now I'm finding out not so much. Well, this continued on. I did my best to keep my mouth shut, but that's not that easy for me. And when I got the next performance review in six months' time, I did not get a five out of five stars. In fact, I didn't get any stars, and that entitled me to no bonus. And man, did that hurt. That was a real shock. So what did I do? I quit. I figured these people don't get me. I'm not really valued here. This isn't the right environment for me. I'm just going to go do my own thing. I'm obviously not meant for corporate culture. And I went out on my own. That was 2008, and I've been independent ever since. But something was nagging at me. Even after I was out of that company and I was on my own, I was constantly asking myself what had went wrong. Where had I taken a wrong turn? And why wasn't I considered to be as valuable to them as I once had been? And how did I let that get in my way? And it was very confusing. So I went on a sort of journey to discover these answers. I knew that it wasn't my lack of intelligence that got in the way. It had to be something else, but I just wasn't sure what it was. So I started asking myself this question, what does it take to be integral, to be indispensable to a team? Because at one point I was, and then at the next moment I wasn't. So integral has multiple meanings. 
One meaning is to be indispensable, to be necessary, critical to the success of, of an entity. But another meaning of integral is to be whole, to be complete. And as I asked myself this question, I began to wonder, was I fully me in that role? Was I fully me when I showed up to work every day? Was I bringing my whole self to work? Or was there a part of me that felt lacking or missing or incomplete that caused me to behave in such a way that I felt like I had something to prove and caused me to speak out of turn and rub people the wrong way. So I became obsessed with answering this question and I did a whole lot of research to try to figure out what had gone wrong. And eventually, I happened upon this cover of Time Magazine. This cover was published in 1995 when a book by Daniel Goleman named Emotional Intelligence was published. Now, he was a New York Times writer at the time, and this book became an international bestseller. And in this book, he talks about how it's not just our intelligence or our cognitive intelligence that really makes us successful in our work and in our lives. But there's actually another type of intelligence that is even more critical to our future success. Now, this took the world by storm in 1995, but when I happened upon it, it wasn't something that had been present in my workplace. I don't know about yours. It wasn't a conversation that we were having at work. And I didn't even really know much about what it was. I had heard the term EQ before, but I didn't know what that meant. And what I discovered was that though this was the cover in 1995, it was actually back in 1973 when Daniel Goleman's professor wrote a paper, um, his name is David McClellan, he wrote a paper on how scholastic aptitude tests are a worse predictor of future success than emotional intelligence assessments and that actually how high our emotional intelligence is, is a much greater predictor of how successful we are in our work and in our lives. And here this was a concept that had been published in 1973, a best-selling book in 1995, but 2015, this still isn't a topic that we talk about as a part of our work and in our workplaces all that often. So there, it turns out, is there are a lot of models for explaining what emotional intelligence is, but the one that has resonated with me the most is social and emotional intelligence, and it has these four quadrants. There's the awareness of ourselves, and the management of ourselves, so knowing our emotional state and then being able to regulate that emotional state and regulate our own behavior. And then there is the awareness of other people's emotional states and regulating how we interact in social situations. And there are actually several different competencies that are within each of these quadrants. And so as I came to learn this, it set me out on a journey and it got me thinking, well, if there are all of these different competencies, what am I missing? Because there was clearly something that had gone wrong for me and created a detour in my career. So I happened upon a social and emotional intelligence assessment and I took it, and here's what I found. 
This is actually my social and emotional intelligence profile. This is not a sample that I'm showing you. I'm gonna point out a few key things. You may notice there are a few dips in this graph. Well, the first valley that you see in this picture that's in the yellow zone, that's the average zone, that's stress management. And the competency of stress management, that I'm just average in that, it did not surprise me. I run my own business, I'm very hard on myself, I work really long hours. That I'm not managing my stress as well as I could, not a surprise. But you may be noticing there's an even bigger dip than that one. And that's in the vulnerable category. That competency is behavioral self-control. Now, I don't want to alarm anybody. I'm not gonna do something crazy up here. But I wanna tell you a little bit about how behavioral self-control is described. They say that people who lack the competence of behavioral self-control react impulsively, get involved in inappropriate situations because they can't resist the temptation, respond to problems in a non-constructive way, are quick to anger, tend to be defensive, may become angry, depressed, or agitated when faced with conflicts and stress on the job, may even think of quitting. So there it was, staring right back at me. What had gone wrong all those years ago? Here were my answers. There were clearly some things about myself that I didn't really understand that I thought I knew myself so well, I thought I was so evolved and self-aware, but it turns out there were actually some missing elements that were having a negative impact on how I interacted with other people, especially in the workplace. So this realization was a big one for me. And it eventually led me to want to help other people learn this about themselves. And so I became interested in coaching and I pursued a certification at a coaching program called New Ventures West. It was a year long program. And in this program, they taught us that people are made up of these three things, a mind, a heart, and a body. Does anyone feel that they don't possess one of these things? Thought I saw a hand. But what we may not realize or recognize often enough is that in most workplaces, all we really value are our minds. We become these disembodied heads floating around and what we value in others are their smarts and what we feel is valued in us is our intelligence. And there are these other parts of us that aren't showing up. They're just not appropriate for the workplace. They're not relevant for the workplace. And it turns out the opposite is true. There is a lot more to us than we tend to acknowledge. We have our minds, our cognitive intelligence to think, but we also have our hearts, our emotional intelligence to feel, and we have our bodies, our senses, in order to feel energy, to actually have this somatic intelligence, as it's called. Sometimes, you might find that when you walk into a meeting, there's just something off. You have this sense that maybe they were talking about you before you walked in the room, or they were talking about some sensitive information. That is your body sensing 
the energy. It is not your cognitive intelligence that's telling you something is awry. We often have these phrases in language, like I have butterflies in my stomach. Before I came on stage today, I definitely had butterflies in my stomach. Why do we have that language? Because there's actually sensations going on that have key pieces of information for us that we could be utilizing in order to better understand our environments, better understand the context that we're working with and working in. And yet we don't give our bodies enough credit to listen to that stuff because we're so intellectual and our society is so focused on cognitive intellect. Now, what I learned in my coaching program that was so valuable to me is that we are not operating as our best selves. We are thinking one thing, feeling another thing, and doing something else entirely. I'm sure many of you can identify with this feeling that we don't always do what we think is best. Sometimes we feel things that are outside of what we think we're supposed to do. And as a result, our mind, heart, and body is not aligned. It's fragmented. And so we're not bringing all of our intelligences, all of our resources to do our best work. So then the question becomes, how do we become integrated again? How do we find this alignment? How do we think and feel and do one thing rather than feeling fragmented and disjointed? So in the coaching that I have been doing with individuals, designers, developers, business leaders, project managers, marketers, a whole slew of people that work in technology for the last couple years, I have been finding that there are some consistent areas where we could be improving, and that's what I really want to share with you today. But first, I want to push back a little bit on this idea that we may have that our bodies are irrelevant when it comes to work. This is a study that was conducted in 2013. And what this is called is a body map. This research was done with over 700 participants across the world. And what they found is that universally, emotions are connected to physical sensations in the body. What I mean by universally is that regardless of the person's language, culture, geographic location, age, when they were shown images and videos that conjured particular emotions, they then identified those emotions as being in very similar physical areas. And so the conclusion that could be made is that we feel things similarly to one another. Our bodies are actually programmed to connect with our emotions. And on this graph, the blue represents a decreased sensation, and the yellow represents an increased sensation. So you can see that for sadness, there is a loss of sensation in the limbs, the legs and the arms. For depression, that lack of sensation goes to the head and the upper shoulders as well. Whereas for happiness, we have an increased sensation in the heart area and in the head area. But then if you take a look at love, it's not just an increased sensation in the head and the heart, but also in the nether regions. And so this is fascinating. We all have, we have these sensations kind of wired into our bodies that relate to these different emotions. So when we see this, I can't help but ask, can we really change? Is it really possible for us to change our emotional state or change our behavior if this is how we're all wired? 
Well, I have one word for you. Neuroplasticity. Has anyone heard of neuroplasticity? Good, I'm seeing hands. Neuroplasticity is a relatively new concept. Even 20 years ago, scientists did not believe that after a certain age, the early 20s, that our minds could change at all. We had exactly the brain makeup that we were going to have, and it would be fixed for the rest of our lives. What they are now learning is that it is actually possible to rewire our responses to emotional stimuli. That means that we have the control through exercises and practices that get us behaving differently in response to emotional reaction, we can literally change our minds. We can change the wiring in our brains. So, these qualities that I am most commonly finding with my clients and very much with myself that we need to focus on are these four, one in each of these four quadrants of social and emotional intelligence. Presence in the category of self-awareness, adaptability in the category of self-management, empathy in the category of other awareness, and influence in the category of other management. And I'm gonna go through these one by one. So we will start with presence. So what is presence? I think of presence as being here now. Being conscious of the moment that we are actually living in right now. So many of us have our minds stuck in the past, going over something that happened last night with our significant other, thinking about what your boss said to you before you came on this trip, or our minds are in the future. What session am I gonna go to next? What am I gonna have for dinner tonight? How am I gonna find that person that I wanna meet up with? Who can honestly say that they aren't thinking about anything other than what I'm saying in this very moment? I struggle with presence and I work on this all day every day. I'm standing up here and I'm looking out at you and I'm thinking, do they like what I have to say? Does my jacket fit okay? Do I have something in my teeth? We're always thinking about things that are outside of what we're actually experiencing right now. Let me tell you a story about a client that I work with who really struggles with presence. It's what I call the distractive creative. How many of you work in environments that look something like this? Open floor plan, lots of people on the phone having discussions. Sometimes it can feel really impossible to get anything done. And I work with a designer, a creative director, who is responsible for setting the vision for a lot of her projects. And when there's so much activity going on in her environment all the time, it can feel impossible to concentrate, impossible to be fully focused and engaged with her work. And what's going on around her isn't the half of it. Take a look at her computer. 50 tabs open in Chrome, She's got three different projects open at a time, going back and forth. She's got her hip chat that her coworkers have to be on 24 hours a day so they can constantly communicate. She's always being interrupted by people, asking for things, asking questions. 
So it isn't just what's going on around her, but it's also what's happening right in front of her eyes all day, every day. It can feel impossible to get out of this. So when people are assessed for their social and emotional intelligence, and they are noted as being cautionary, on the cautionary end of the scale for presence, the signs of that are that they're frequently distracted, they have overactive mental chatter, like I was explaining earlier, there's always something going on in their heads. They may find themselves easily irritated because they can't focus. They find that there's an imbalance in their work and home lives. Perhaps they're always thinking about work when they're at home and vice versa. When it gets kind of bad, they may be treating people abrasively without even realizing it because they're not aware of their own emotional state and they're not aware of how they're interacting with others. And when it gets really bad, they have unexplained aches and pains. And that's something that I can identify with because sometimes we're so disconnected from our bodies while we're working, we're hunched over at the computer or we're in this strange position and at the end of the day, we're like, oh my God, why does my shoulder hurt so much? We've been contorted all day, but completely unaware of it. And maybe you do something that I do, put off going to the bathroom. It's like, let me just fix this one line of code. I've, I've got it, I'm right there, I've got it. And then it's like two hours later and you realize you still haven't peed. And we wonder why our bodies aren't feeling their best. Now, when you're on the other end of the spectrum, when we develop our presence, we come to better understand our own emotions because we're in touch. We're actually listening to ourselves in the moment rather being somewhere else. We're able to better focus. We feel more at peace and more calm. We actually have heightened experiences and memories because if you're actually there, mentally, when it's happening, you're gonna remember it better. If you're on Twitter or email while it's happening, chances are you're gonna remember your email and your Twitter, not the experience you are physically actually having. And lastly, when we really develop our presence, we're able to feel more connected to our own personal truth meaning we get to know ourselves because we're with ourselves all the time rather than being elsewhere. So I've got to ask you, where do you fit on this scale? As we go through these four quadrants, I'd love for you to be asking yourself, where am I? And also be asking, where are my colleagues? Where's my client, my boss, my partner? my mom, or my nemesis. When we have this information about ourselves, it's incredibly valuable because it changes the way we're able to conduct ourselves. But also having this information about others that we interact with and collaborate with gives us a much better understanding of how to interact with them because we know what they're grappling with, what they're dealing with, and what might be getting in their way. So I ask you to continue to ask yourselves this. So there are lots of ways to develop presence and I'm gonna share with you a few of my favorites. And these are ones that I use personally and I also offer with my coaching clients and find that they have great success with them. Firstly, I believe in journaling. This is not a dear diary, your hopes and wishes and whatever you might imagine diary journaling might look like. This is called morning pages and it's actually a technique that comes from a book called The Artist's Way. And the idea is that first thing in the morning when you wake up, before your coffee, before your shower, before whatever your morning routine is, you write longhand three full pages of whatever is on your mind. Whether it's what you were dreaming about, what your to-do list looks like for today, what you're worrying about, 
Or even if you have nothing on your mind at all and you just say for three pages, I can't think of anything, I can't think of anything. It has a way of getting everything out. And they say the hand doesn't lie. You'll be very surprised by what you write about when you do this. And once it's done, you can go about the rest of your day without this stuff on your head. It really has a, an enormous impact. And I find that that stream of consciousness is a wonderful way to start the day and get a lot of stuff out so that I don't have to carry it with me and get in my way the rest of the day. You can also observe your thoughts. And this might seem like a foreign concept to some, because at least for me, up until recently, I believed that all those thoughts in my head were me. It sounds like my voice, and it sounds like me talking to me all day long. But it turns out that's not me. I'm the one doing the listening. And when we are too enmeshed with those thoughts, we let them lead us astray. Those thoughts come and go. That's just how the brain works. It could very well be a message that your boss planted in there or your coworker, or maybe even from early childhood, this story that you're constantly repeating to yourself. But you are the observer of those thoughts. Those thoughts are not you. And when you separate yourself, you're able to recognize, OK, I had that thought, but I don't actually believe it. That's not actually true. Bye-bye thought, like a cloud that just floats on by. It's an incredibly powerful practice. And then my third favorite way to develop presence is to just stop. How many of us at work give ourselves that? To just sit at our desks, close our eyes, and breathe consciously. Being connected to the breath is one of the most powerful ways of being present. It roots us because it is something that is happening only in the present moment, and it's always happening. Yet how conscious are we of our own breath during the day? It's this incredible force where it is both involuntary and voluntary. And so when we take a moment to stop and breathe and just connect with that, it has a way of clearing out the mind. I'm just going to listen to the sound of my own breath for 10 seconds. It's like hitting a reset button on your brain. Now, some of you might be thinking, it sounds like she's talking about meditation. And I don't know how I feel about meditation. Meditation as a term is tied up with a lot of religion and spirituality. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that is available to you wherever you are, your own breath. And I want to share some interesting research that shows that just taking that time to reconnect and breathe and clear our minds is very, very critical to our healthy functioning. If you don't want to call it meditation, you could call it sitting. You could call it pausing and breathing. It's like a shower for the mind. We feel the need to wash our bodies, at least some of us, mostly every day. Why don't we do the same for our minds, considering how much we're using our minds all day every day? What this is showing is the difference in the brain through fMRI from when we're not meditating to a brain that is meditating. And what you see is significantly more connection being made, a lot more activity in the brain during meditation. Ironically enough, we're thinking less, but we have greater connectivity in our brains. Another study shows 
the difference in activity and connectivity in the brain, not only when we're meditating, but actually more active brains for those who are meditators, even when they're not meditating. That is how powerful that simple act of taking a break, closing your eyes, and taking a few deep breaths and listening to your breath can be. This does not have to be 30 minutes of Zen. It's quite easier than that. Next, we're gonna move on to adaptability. And this is in the quadrant of self-management. Now, I like to define adaptability as allowing space for change. And Dries actually touched on this quite a bit yesterday in his keynote. Change is coming to the Drupal community. Change is happening in our work environments all the time. But as our platforms and our tools change, it can be very scary to feel like now everything we do has to change too, and how can we possibly keep up? But adaptability is key in business success. So being able to work fle be flexible and to work effectively with different groups of people makes a huge difference in our ability to succeed. I was working with a client who brought me in to help them identify the right strategy and positioning for a new feature that was gonna be integrated into their existing app. And the key stakeholders, the senior leaders in the company had been going back and forth and back and forth on what the right strategy was between these two strategies. And the development team was understandably very tired of having to constantly switch gears. So in what felt like the 11th hour, they brought me in and I helped them conduct research and come to a definitive answer on which strategy was going to be more effective when it came to their launch. And unfortunately, that was the strategy opposite from the one that the development team had most recently been working on. And when we presented the findings, the develop, two of the developers just said, no way. We're not changing this again. We are on track to launch. We already know when we're gonna submit to the App Store. We don't wanna deal with this. And we had to accept that answer and say, okay, well then I guess it's gonna have to be post-launch in a second version. And what do you think happened when the app launched? It failed. They had felt that they couldn't possibly be any more flexible, and as a result, it was a really bad launch. And they had to go back to the drawing board later. So, those who are on the cautionary end of adaptability find it very challenging to juggle multiple demands that are coming at them. They find that when priorities change, it's hard to adjust with those priorities and it feels very stressful to do so. They may be slow to see things from another perspective of how now that we know what the right strategy is, we're gonna guarantee a more successful launch, so let's go with that. And it just felt like too impossible to see things from any perspective other than their own. And lastly, when we are really on the cautionary end of adaptability, we can be so aggravated by change that even when it's positive, we see it as a negative. That any change at all is bad. But when we develop our adaptability, we know how to um, accept these surprises when they arise. We recognize that surprises are a part of work we become willing and able to generate alternative solutions because we're more devoted to solving the problem than we are connected to our own baby of a solution. And we ultimately know how to negotiate so that everyone wins. 
so that, yes, we can continue to change, but that there is a way for us to get the best out of the situation and for the other person to get the best out of the situation. Last year, a report came out by Wright Management in the UK called the Flux Report. And in that report, 91% of HR directors said that they think that by 2018, people will be recruited on their ability to deal with change and uncertainty, 91%. 53% said that employees' ability to deal with unanticipated problems is the key attribute for business success. So these are the people that are doing the hiring. Important to listen to what they consider to be the most important competencies. So three key ways to develop our adaptability. One is that when we have come to a solution, to feel free to brainstorm alternatives. Just because this is the one that we think is best doesn't mean that it's going to work. And sometimes there are constraints that we don't even know about. And so it's best to be able to be open-minded and to be able to brainstorm all the other ways to solve the problem so that if a change needs to happen, we're ready. Secondly, we need to observe our reactions to change. Just as we need to observe our thoughts in order to develop presence, we have to deserve, observe our reactions. So when a boss or someone in another department or a client says, here's the new deal, we got to move forward in this other way, and it's an unanticipated change, watch yourself. Do you get angry? Do you get defensive? Or is it, OK, that's what needs to be done. Let me put my energy in to doing the best that I can on this new direction. And then lastly, the most powerful way to develop our adaptability that I have found is in throwing away our old work. I have, for many years, carried boxes from move to move to move of my old notes, old wireframes, sketches, ideas that I had for projects, thinking one day, that's you know, so genius, I'll be able to go back to it and use it for something. And I carted these boxes around with me. And I realized that if the idea was so good, I'd think of it again. And if it wasn't that good of an idea, then why was I carrying it around with me? So I tossed it all. <laughs> when you get that monkey off your back, so to speak, you're now free. You're free to have new ideas and not be indebted to or in service to an old version of yourself, which, by the way, you've learned a lot since then. It's not as good as you think it is. Next, we have empathy. And this is in the social awareness bucket. Empathy is a topic that I talk about constantly. I think it is everything. I define empathy as the ability to feel another person's feelings. This isn't the same thing as just imagining their situation and understanding that they're in a tough place or being able to comprehend and communicate their needs. But to actually feel what they feel on an emotional level without having necessarily experienced the same situation before. So it's kind of a vicarious feeling of another person. So I was working with a team where we were conducting a lot of research, a lot of user interviews. And as with many of the projects that I work on, I was responsible for doing a lot of the recruiting. And I happened to recruit a woman who, unbeknownst to me, was a real squeaky wheel. She had written many times to this company to get them to add new features. 
She was always writing the support email, telling them that things were broken or she needed help. And when the team found out that we were going to be interviewing her, they were not too happy about it. Well, I thought it was a great opportunity for them to actually get to know her and maybe we would come to a better understanding of what was underlying all of these complaints. We conducted the interview and as she was leaving, I said to the team, oh my God, isn't that amazing? Now we know, now we have such a better understanding of her. And the product lead looked at me and said, gosh, I hate that woman. And I realized that they weren't really listening to her because they went in thinking they didn't like her, thinking she was an annoyance. The stories that we hold about people get in the way of us genuinely connecting with them. Here was an opportunity lost to gain empathy for someone who clearly cares a lot about this company because she's always getting in touch. She's a very engaged customer. So when we are lacking empathy, we find sometimes it's hard reading other people. If we feel like we can never really tell what's up with other people, that could be a sign that we're lacking empathy. When we're in conversation with people, we might find that we're waiting for our turn to speak rather than really listening, like we're planning our response. We often may assume that we know how the other person feels rather than asking them and getting that information firsthand. When it gets really cautionary, we start to believe that everyone thinks like we do. I'm just gonna design this for me because if I design it for me and it's good for me to use, then clearly everyone else is gonna be able to use it too, right? And lastly, we might find that we're really surprised by what someone else has done. So they behave in a way that's so outside of our view of what is possible for them that it comes as a shock. Now when we develop our empathy, we're able to more easily understand other people's perspectives. We can more accurately read other people's mu moods and nonverbal cues, not just what they're saying, but pick up on their energy level, pick up on their facial expressions. We then are able to better predict their reactions because we know that they respond to things differently than we do. We're able to work with a wide variety of people of diverse backgrounds and relate well to them and respect them regardless of our differences. And then best of all, we're better adept at effectively serving other people's needs. And that's really what we're all doing here, building things for other people to use. So last year, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with a report in which they mention the fastest growing occupations in the United States. And I wanna read that list to you. Sports coaches and fitness trainers, masseuses and registered nurses, physical therapists, school psychologists, music tutors, preschool teachers, speech language pathologists, personal financial planners, chauffeurs, and private detectives. Each one of those professions is expected to employ at least 20% more people in the United States by the year 2020. And what is the one skill that all of those occupations have in common? Empathy. So how can you develop your empathy? Ways that I have found really work is to assess our listening. Are we waiting to respond? Are we planning our response in our heads? Or are we truly listening to what the other person says? In Stephen Covey's book, The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, 
Habit five is empathetic listening. And in um, Primal Leadership, another wonderful book, they talk about how the most effective form of listening is listening with the intent to agree. How many of us honestly start conversations with our colleagues and our loved ones where we've set the intention that regardless of the, what the other person says, we're going to agree with them? I know that that isn't something that I do very naturally, but it is certainly something that I have been developing. We then need to watch for cues, those nonverbal cues, body language that other people are exhibiting that tells a much broader story about what they're experiencing than their words alone. And lastly, this one might sound strange, but read more literary fiction. A study actually came out that showed that when compared with reading nonfiction and popular fiction, after an extended time of reading, people's emotional intelligence scores in the realm of empathy increased when they had been reading the literary fiction, whereas the empathy levels in the two other categories of books did not increase. And they believe that's because in literary fiction, the language is very detailed and there's a lot of imagery and it causes us to use our imaginations. Whereas other types of writing is often very literal or matter, matter of fact. And then lastly, we have the category of influence within relationship management. And there is a client that I've been working with who I've been coaching for the last year. When he entered into a management position for the first time, he had been a maker for all the years of his career before then. And now suddenly, as a manager, he realized that it was taking a totally different set of skills to succeed than it did as a maker. And among those skills that he was grappling with was his ability to evangelize the principles that he believes in and the value of the work that he does, not only up the food chain to senior management, but also to influence the work of the people that he was now responsible for. So when we ha are on the cautionary end of the influence scale, we tend not to, tar um, to tailor our argument or our presentation to the people that we are presenting to. It's like the same message every time. We're not taking into account, using our empathy, what that other person needs to hear and we find it hard to communicate a common vision that includes other people and empowers them. And worst of all, if we're in a position of authority, we rely on the authority and the power rather than feeling that we actually need to inspire people or the flip side, if we don't feel that we have the authority, we come, become so resigned that we won't even try. And when we're, on, when we're developing our influence, now we're turning other people into evangelists who can share our message for us rather than everything having to come from us. So there is a study that I won't get into too much detail on because my time is just about up, if not already up, where um, people who demonstrated the greatest amount of influence their brains lit up while they were processing what the pitch was gonna be, not only when they were giving the pitch. They didn't see increased brain activity in the giving of the pitch of the most influential people, but when they were thinking about and preparing for the pitch, a different area in their brain, the bilateral TPJ lit up. So, know the audience that you're giving your presentation to or whom you have to influence, through developing empathy for them. Observe someone else who you consider to be very influential and look at the techniques and strategies that they use. And most of all, when someone thanks you for a job well done or for doing something for them, 
say you're welcome, this isn't something we do very easily. We often say, no, 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 it was nothing, it was no big deal, or no, thank you. It has been found that when we accept a thank you from someone else by saying you're welcome, it reinforces in their mind that we are a person of influence. What I believe this all comes down to, how to be integral, is to operate with integrity. And I believe that when we develop our presence, our adaptability, our empathy and our influence, we are working from a place of integrity where we are really fully whole and we are bringing all of our intelligences and all of our assets to the work that we do. 20 years later, this is now the cover of Time Magazine, The Mindful Revolution. What has been called emotional intelligence for a long time is now being broadened to these ancient practices of mindfulness. I don't have the time to get into it now, but there are companies, both large and small, all over the world that are bringing mindfulness practices into their organizations. And so this is not some fringe idea that I'm talking about up here. This is change that's really happening, and we want to be on the forefront of it. Two questions that I want you to ask yourselves as you leave here today. What would it be like if I had more blank? And what kind of invitation am I to others? What do I need to be integral? We all have room to grow. We all have room to know ourselves better. And when we're working on ourselves collectively, we become better to the community, we become better to our organizations, and we become better to the world overall. Thank you so much for listening. I ran long, so I don't know what time we have for Q&A, but I also wanted to point you to the URL at the bottom of the slide. I have put together some self-reflection questions for you to assess your own aptitude in each of these categories. You can go to that URL, get the full set of slides, as well as those self-assessment questions. Thank you so much. Do we have time? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see that people are headed out to the next session. And one of the first questions that I want to ask, do you have a seat here? OK. Um, is um, the, the Twitter Ooh. response, yeah, they're, they're deep, aren't they? Um, the, the Twitter response was effectively, this is amazing, or where's the Drupal? Too much of the woo-woo stuff. Where's my Drupal? I've heard it before. So tell me, how does this actually fit into technology? Why is this relevant to a technical community who has this issue queue thing where conversations happen, why should we actually be thinking about our behavior in this issue queue thing? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Perhaps those of you who are leaving may not know this. You're a human being. <laughs> we are all human beings. If you think that you're sense of self and knowing yourself does not matter, then you should probably let a machine do your job. I feel very passionately, obviously, that there's work that all of us can do. And especially when we work with Drupal, we are members of a community that are lifting each other up together. And if you're not aware of how you're coming off, how you're behaving, how your lack of self-care is impacting you, chances are you're not going to be an integral member of the community for very long. And I think we've seen this, that people burn out of this community and many other technology communities because they push themselves full force without any self-awareness of what it's doing to them. The negative consequences that it's having that potentially can have lifelong impact. What can we do as community members to support those who we feel are perhaps in a personal transition or they're not, they're not really as engaged and delightful as they used to be? How can we support our friends in our community and how can we also perhaps sometimes help to release them from the community when it's time to go? 
it's not the answer you're gonna wanna hear. Oh. <laughs> we really can't do this for other people. I work with a lot of different people and most of the time they come to me and in the act of doing so, I know they're gonna be fine because they've recognized that there is an issue, whatever the issue is, large or small, that they want to resolve. When people are forced into changing themselves, it causes more defensiveness and they lock in tighter. So you really, as I was taught in my coaching program, cannot force a breakthrough with a sledgehammer. You need to find an opening and put a small wedge in it to keep it open so that perhaps there is an interruption in their lives or some kind of conflict that's going on that serves as an opportunity for someone to say, maybe there's something more for you to look at here, but allowing them to look at themselves. Would you be willing and or interested to follow up with our community working group to help empower them to, um, whether it's coach or whether, you know, whatever the right verb is, uh, the community members who we've got who do come forward and do say, I think I, think I might need some help with this. Yes, I would okay. love that. I believe that coaching is a skill set that we all need to possess as well, where we make a shift from feeling like it's our responsibility to solve everyone's problems. You mean it's not? It's not. Oh, God. I know, and it frustrates <laughs> me, and I love a good problem to a place where we're enabling other people to solve their own problems. Thank you so much for your talk today. Thank, Thank you, you for being so vulnerable much. with our community. It was amazing. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.